Okay, everybody. Welcome to Unit Masters Cohort 4. We are in Live Speaker Session 4. And today we are in week two of our six weeks Unit Masters program. And the overall top topic is about the evolution of the internet. And we have with us Irina, who is sharing about her, her perspective on what is the internet of value? What are the differences between the different um, blockchains? What is a third generation blockchain? And you know, how does this actually all inform the work that she's doing? In, in today's world. It's super exciting. And thank you very much, Irina, to join us. And the stage is open for you. You'll have the time to share about 20, 25 minutes, and then we open up for Q&A from our audience. Oh, just one second. OK, thank you, Yir. Thank you, thank you team, uh, for having me here today. Uh, very excited to share my journey, which is quite unusual and hopefully inspirational, especially for those of you who are not uh, coming to blockchain space from technical background, uh, who's not a developer, or who doesn't have a previous experience working in financial sector. Uh, because for me, this journey, actually, my background, I'm just going to share with you a presentation. Okay, perfect. So a few words about myself. Actually, I'm an architect by education. Uh, I've always been passionate about technologies, but from the side of, say, uh, smart cities, uh, smart buildings, and anything that technology can do with our urban environment and environment in general. And I also belong to the generation that kind of grew up with the internet. So um, it, it was kind of normal for me to, you know, use email and web two technologies uh, from the very early age. Uh, and then uh, during my studies, during my bachelor, uh, written a couple of articles on smart cities and uh, smart homes and the use of devices uh, in the house. And then my master's thesis was about the use of ill and data for collecting uh, anonymous aggregated mobile phone data from users in the city and then uh, combining it with the social economic data to allow government uh, enterprises and service providers to give a better service to the city and to uh, have more information of an actual use of the city. So I really see information and data as the gold of the 21st century and a lot of our you know companies that are are prosperous these days are the companies that manage data so my story how i got into a blockchain um i heard first of it uh, i heard back in year 2016 when the book um Blockchain, the blockchain revolution uh, came came to the market, written by Don Tapscott. It, it was my first approach to understanding, uh, you know, why it is something. This technology is something beyond Bitcoin, because at the time of Bitcoin um, creation, um, everybody was sort of treating it as, uh, you know, digital money, something about money. There was a lot of hype about, around it, but uh, I didn't see it as an application for business like real. I, I couldn't find a real use case. And also at the time, all the applications uh, where you could buy Bitcoin were so complex and it was so difficult to get access to it. That is, you know, unless you had um, a friend who's a developer, somebody who understood the space from the tech perspective, it was nearly impossible to get in, to, to take active part in this ecosystem. Uh, and then the more I started to kind of study what, when I moved to London, and I also moved to London from Milan in 2016, and I discovered PropTech movement, which um, has a lot, uh, has a lot of uh, blo like blockchain uh, is a is a great part of the PropTech movement because it has so many blockchain has so many applications in many different industries. Uh, so the, the message that I want to communicate here is why blockchain is important is because before we had internet of information, we really had copies distributed 
over the internet and we had no control of our data. Big social media companies had it, uh, search engines had it, but we didn't have it. And blockchain is really what is giving us the power back, the power of managing our own information, but most importantly, managing our assets, managing our money, um, anything that we want to share and any other type of assets. And further down the road, I'll move to the NFT space and why it is so important as an asset class on chain. Uh, so why actually, um, I discovered Polkadot in August, 2020. Uh, and it's actually kind of a funny story because, um, well, first I, I found it for, for a serious cause because I was looking for projects that are working with smart cities and I came across Robinomics, which is a project built on Ethereum, but then also on Polkadot. Uh, and they're um, building robot economy on chain uh, on Polkadot. But then someone gave me, um, Ethereum for present for my birthday, which was in August last year. And um, since I began following Polkadot, I discovered KSM. So I bought KSM and I still hodl it from, from that day one. Uh, and this was a really good example for me of also a financial impact of this technology and how it really does, you know, give you a better return on your investment uh, rather than conventional, traditional, financial system. So what happens with different types of blockchain at the beginning when Bitcoin um, was created, Bitcoin is a first generation blockchain. It is designed to improve financial systems uh, and offer decentralized monetary platforms that put control back in our hands. Then Ethereum was created by Vitaly Buterin and it was the, the second generation blockchain which added a layer uh, of smart contracts so you could create conditions, uh, right? You can write logic, you could write. So it amplified the use of blockchain. It amplified the ways in which you could manage transactions. And now Polkadot uh, and some other blockchains of third generation are changing this uh, landscape of blockchains dramatically because those blockchains really allow two most important things, scalability and interoperability. So that means that this type of blockchain can sustain mass adoption and uh, improve transaction speed uh, and can be scaled and used in more enterprises and in more businesses. Um, many people often ask me, so what is the fundamental difference between um, Polkadot and Ethereum. Uh, so if we look at Ethereum layer one, right? So let's let's uh, not confuse it with Ethereum layer two because actually Ethereum 2.0 is meant to be the third generation blockchain. But Ethereum first layer um, is a single chain that extends its functionality through deployment of lots of code onto the chain. And Polkadot is fully extensible and scalable blockchain thanks to the substrate framework and is actually considered to be a blockchain of blockchain. So uh, you, by the architecture, you can build your own blockchain, you connect it to the relay chain for security and stability. Uh, and that allows relay chain has many slots where different blockchains can connect to. Uh, and now what happens is that it, there is a possibility that you can build many different relay chains. So the, the scale, uh, the way you can scale is really, really uh, has no limitation. And Ethereum uh, first layer is uh, basically an infrastructure for smart contracts. Uh, and it's always executed on a single virtual machine. So in Polkadot, developers can integrate logics in different blockchains. And it also uh, helps to avoid bottlenecks and avoid forking because consensus um, is solved in Polkadot automatically. It uses two mechanisms. I would not get uh, very deep into that as this is more a development uh, conversation. But uh, the fundamental difference here is that we do not have forks and DAOs also happen in Polkadot environment in an automatic way. So 
Polkadot augmentation scaling. Uh, so another thing is that Polkadot is not like many, uh, many headlines uh, used, used to say, especially there was, there was a hype a couple of months ago. It's not an enemy of Ethereum. It's not a competitor of Ethereum. It's just fundamentally uh, a scaling solution for Ethereum because thanks to the integration of EVM, uh, which is Ethereum virtual machine into Polkadot, code, you can uh, build bridges and you can build integrations to Ethereum ecosystem. So you can scale it up and you can allow that to run on both Ethereum and Polkadot. So uh, it's not really a, a competition. Uh, so what can be built on Polkadot? There is an entire world there, right? You can use it for enterprise, for data storage, for finance, supply chain, healthcare. It can be used for real estate transactions, for social networks, for gaming applications. Uh, it can be used for the purpose of governing uh, our, our cities, either for identity management, for education certification uh, issues, for smart contracts, in-law, land titles. Uh, and the most important thing about any blockchain is actually the community. And uh, the reason why I joined Polkadot was to join the community, the community of people who not only build, so not only developers, but also people who hold tokens, because ambassadors in any blockchain project are fundamentally people who invested in the project, who supported the project by the means of tokens. So they have the possibility to participate uh, in the governance of the chain by voting using their tokens and using other utilities that the token of a particular network has. Uh, and any blockchain project from the business point of view, uh, its business model has network effects. So without the community, you cannot actually, like your blockchain doesn't really make much sense because if you don't have people using it, you don't have, you know, utility for your token and the scale that your business may need to uh, to use this blockchain. So communities are fundamental uh, and ambassador programs are fundamental for blockchain projects. So what is, what is network effect? Actually in the traditional business, you could see it with companies like, uh, like Facebook, like Uber, like Airbnb. Uh, network effect business model actually was enabled by the internet. Uh, and if you think about, like, there is a, often this confusion between the open source support uh, and the networks. So majority of the code in the blockchain, which is a beautiful thing, is open source. And it can be available to everyone so people can, yeah, developers can take it and, and build their applications using the code to amplify and scale the ecosystem. But without people using it, as I said, uh, it's just an empty blueprint and it's filled with data. It needs to be filled with data with users uh, and form a network of services. Uh, and some of the projects in Polkadot ecosystem include an NFT chain, Oxama and Polkadot, which is a unique network, Robonomics, an open source platform for Internet of Things, uh, Money Market, DeFi Hub, and a cross chain bridge. Um, Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, so now you want to share with us about your unique. Yeah, web two, web two problems and the web three era. <laughs> so, uh, as you saw, there are many applic applications to uh, to to the uh, to the third generation blockchains. Um, yes, I wanted to closely share, like, switch a little bit of focus on the blockchain that I know uh, in more detail, as I have a pleasure to be working with the most amazing team that is building infrastructure of uh, an NFT infrastructure and middleware on which we can build all type of uh, NFT applications and store different assets. Like why I'm so passionate about NFTs because, you know, being an architect and working in, with collectibles in luxury sector, uh, I got really closely involved in, in the luxury business. And I always appreciate the art and like beautiful thing, uh, but really there are so many, you know, uh, it, it's been something very exclusive until the, the moment NFTs um, 
appeared. Uh, and now what we see is that actually everybody can own a piece. And there are some amazing features in the NFT space like refundability. Uh, so you, but which means you can have ownership of a particular piece because the central concept of NFTs is actually ownership structure. So by enabling this on-chain and NFT blockchain, we enable to ex the possibility to exercise ownership rights, just like those we have in the real world uh, when we own a car or when we own an apartment or when we own something um, of, of value, we can exercise the bundle of rights on NFTs, just like we exercise them on, on a car or anything that we own, uh, which is amazing because in the internet 2.0, this was not possible. Uh, everything was copied. Uh, you had images, you could send them via email, you could send your documents via email. Uh, intellectual property was something that, that was difficult to control. And it became an issue for many music platforms, for many art pl platforms. So how do you prove, you know, when, when you have millions of images distributed around that you are the owner, that it's not been uh, copied, that it's not been taken from you and you invested your time and your knowledge in creating this particular piece. And what happens with NFTs is that still, maybe it's now you can compare it like having copies and photographs of Mona Lisa all over the internet, but we perfectly know who's the owner, right? If it's, it's, if it's owned by the museum or if it's owned by a, a private collector. So the same thing is with NFTs. You, everybody, all media can tweet about it, but you can go on chain and see the hash and see the owner and track all the transactions. And uh, another beautiful thing about NFTs is that artists and creators can have control of their royalties. So now companies cannot dictate them anymore who and when and how much they will be paid and for how long. So in a smart contract, you can set up this logic of you want to be paid a 10%, you want to sell uh, 10 copies or 100 copies or just one copy uh, for how much it should be sold the auction prices, et cetera. So all this can be now executed via the internet without needing to have a middleman. And the same, basically, this, this, this is the beauty of the blockchain space that you have complete control. So uh, my opinion here is that we are moving, we've been moving towards the economy of creators for quite a while and um, social media platforms like YouTube allowed us to have uh, creators, to have bloggers, to have people, you know, ex exploring different mediums and being their own TV, uh, you know, their own entertainment and actually make a living on that. Um, and now the same thing is happening, like there is a step forward that we're giving with uh, NFTs and blockchain, uh, capacity of transporting assets from chain uh, that you now can have control and there is no longer that platform where you store your video that has control over this. So you are the one who sets the rules of this game. So you are the one who has power, of course. Um, we're still in a very early age and stage. Uh, it's, it's like a big dream that you can control your finance and you can, you know, you can own everything and control it. But there are many obstacles on the way, such as still we face complications in the UX and UI usage of some platforms. Uh, it is still uh, like someone, <laughs> I've been on a, a panel recently and a colleague of mine said, you know, it's a crypto gymnastics. When you have to go to MetaMask, you have to exchange tokens, you have to buy another token, you have to go back. So it's, it's pretty complex. Uh, and this is another thing that here I want to mention about Unique Network that uh, the business model is to sponsor transaction fees. So anybody who wants to build their application on Unique Network will get sponsorship in form of tokens. So your end client doesn't need to buy any tokens and doesn't need to go through this complex um, procedure of you know exchanging one token to another token uh, because the the main goal 
for mass adoption is to eliminate uh, these frictions and to make it as seamless as possible and as simple as possible using kind of the advantages that we've developed in Web2 space, um, all these beautiful things of user interface where you can click two buttons and you know you just purchase your art without needing uh, to go through different pages and, and actually touch that complexity of cryptocurrency. Yes, yeah, so these are basically uh, fundamental things um, that I wanted to share with you. And I believe it will be good to maybe go through questions and explore and dig deeper in some areas uh, about polka dots or about NFTs. Okay, wonderful. Thanks a lot, Irina, for sharing. Maybe let me kick off the Q&A. You mentioned a dream. Right. What is this dream and how far are we actually away from reaching that dream? What are the real obstacles that are still in the way of realizing that dream? Well, you know, the, this has been a bull run, but to me, it hasn't really been a bull run. It's rather people finally discovered, like myself included, uh, that this technology in this space has a real utility in the real world. And especially thanks to the NFTs, that was like big push DeFi and NFTs, uh, they really gave use cases, real use cases, because when you can buy a little picture, like a little, little art and you can invest in it, or you can buy some tokens and you can stake them and you can earn interest. And you see the difference between your traditional bank and uh, you know what you, the interest rates you earn on some, like when you use some application, even though that is still, still complex. And actually the best way for me is, uh, is, is an investment. So something that you buy and you huddle and you know, you're safe because it is still a very volatile environment, uh, unpredictable, uh, still needs some time for improvement. Uh, but like in the case of KSM, Kusama token, you know, uh, we've seen clearly how hard the teams work and how much of in value that uh, improves. Uh, so the dream is being built right now. And what I believe is happening with uh, mass adoption and people participating in DeFi and in NFT space is that we're getting closer and closer step by step because the reality is that we are building our, our reality and we're building it every single day. And um, uh, I'm really pleased to see more and more educational materials available. You know, you, what you do with this platform, the master classes, um, anything that can be accessed and, you know, improved. Uh, and the more we talk about it, the more we explain how things work, that it's not so dangerous. You know, there are ways of making it safer for people to use. Um, there are assets like stable coins that do not have volatility, but they're still part of ecosystem. Uh, that, that's if we're talking about DeFi. You know, NFTs is, is completely different thing because uh, since the big companies like Krispies and Sotheby's uh, entered this space, they actually made big promises that they are educating their collectors on investments in these digital assets. And NFTs, they really did improve the life of digital art, artists because they were kind of neglected until now because they were not, you know, a lot of traditional collectors, they're used to hold something tangible in the hand. So if you're not holding a real painting, you kind of think, well, okay, that, that digital thing is maybe not so, you know, not so valuable and you don't quite understand what it is about. But then if we look into, or we look on social platforms or um, at brands like, you know, big luxury brands, they actually use a lot of that graphic design, uh, digital images for their advertisement campaigns, uh, for their social media accounts. So these artists who have been creating the whole universe of digital assets, they were neglected because they were kind of there, but we never gave them credit. 
And now because this um, NFTs became so popular and everybody began like uh, advertising on social media, on popular accounts with a lot of following, we finally saw the people behind and, you know, there were some, some guys from Tesla who were just doing designs for fun. And all of a sudden in one night they became famous because they sold uh, their NFT for hundreds of thousands of uh, dollars. So That's yeah, this amazing. is this is happening right now, and it's um, we don't even know what is going to happen in two months and three months. Like all the polka dots, we're now waiting for the mainnet to be alive because, as you know, we're still all in the test mode. Uh, so we're very close to launching Kusama on the mainnet, and uh, the innovation will happen there. Hopefully, we'll see many more use cases, many more projects. Uh, Something will not work because uh, there was a lot of debate um, about, uh, you know, ICOs boom in 2017, uh, that they were so, you know, there were so many things built and then they disappeared. Perhaps we will see that um, many of the NFT projects will not like there's, there's a lot of hype of NFTs about the hundreds of thousands that are sold, uh, but the reality is that the majority of pieces that are uh, on OpenSea, all the marketplaces, they, they cost around $50 per transaction. Uh, but there is also another big use case for that into DeFi space. That's why NFTs are fueling in DeFi so much. So it's, it's a wait and see. Uh, we still don't know. Uh, what will be the, the future, what will be the use, but it's pretty much, I treat it like the web tool, when the websites appeared, when the emails appeared, you know, a lot of people will say, ah, that's, you know, that's all gonna die. And now we all work already in a decentralized environment. We all, you know, in the past year, we all had to be attached to the internet, but regardlessly where you are in the, in, on this planet, uh, the internet became the most important thing. Your computer became the most important thing and access to all the digital tools for work. And this is the reality. We work in the internet, uh, which was, you know, before people were saying, oh, come on, who's going to use email? It's all, it's all just there to, you know, for fun. So. Yeah. What do you think would be like a likely outcome when, when, every, when we have reached mass adoption? How does an everyday life look like for a regular user who just wakes up and then? Well, hopefully we will have the possibility to use banks in our phone and it will be very easy and there will be plenty of applications and wallets and you'll have multiple assets and you could use that without paying high fees and commissions all over the globe because also the big idea, also people who do not have access to banking system will finally have access to financial services because we are, you know, I'm in Europe right now, you know, many of you I'm sure are, are calling from places that are uh, considered to be a developed world, but let's think about, you know, middle of Russia uh, where people don't even have fast internet or don't have banks or Africa where people have no banking service, but there's a, you know, hopefully there is the statistic shows that we have a lot of uh, mobile phones. So there, are, there is a good coverage of mobile networks uh, in regions where there is no banking system. So they can have micro loans. Uh, they can use financial services that we use on a daily basis in the developed world to to buy a computer with a credit or you know to do other other things, fuel your business. Um, so yeah, ho hopefully that would be really the reality of holding assets and also uh, thanks to the NFTs, <clears throat> we'll be able to purchase real estate. Hopefully this is like another, another very interesting area, tokenization of real estate, which to date was mainly a digitization of assets because you would still need to do all the off-chain work and all these procedures complicated involving lawyers and many, many, uh, different stakeholders and land registry. But the moment we have land registry on the blockchain and everything is transparent and we have um, all the documentation dig digitized already, we can talk about tokens and we can talk about, you know, selling your flat somewhere 
or buying a flat you if you live in London you can buy a flat somewhere in Argentina and then rent it or sell it or partially sell it or um, exercise your rights on ownership yeah maybe let's speak about you know the risk length landscape for the ecosystem to evolve further there are certain obstacles hanging from our communities asking is for example regulation a risk for the polka dot ecosystem and if so like you know what what is to be done about it and what are other potential game stoppers in the blockchain industry well regulation you see if you look at the beginning at the summer of 2020 uh, and uh, today there is a lot that has been done in the regulation landscape and most importantly there are discussions about it and lawmakers are getting involved uh, which is a step forward because like any other technology, this is so new that we don't have regulations in place and things need to be reevaluated, uh, assessed and adjusted accordingly because mm, ICOs, you know, uh, in 2017 were a normal thing to do was like a crowdfunding, decentralized, legitimate, but then because some projects use it for, uh, you know, just, just, quick wins and not uh, following the initial purpose, regulators had to step in and had to say, okay, now no ICOs, <laughs> let's regulate this environment because this isn't working, this isn't doing this, doing more harm that is, that is doing good. So this is work in progress. I do not see any regulation risk for DOT in particular. Uh, hopefully countries like there was a lot of debate on the restrictions of cryptocurrencies in different countries and kind of on and off uh, different we always hear different news like some part of the world stopped regulating currencies and like in the Middle East now there is a big movement to support currencies and to um, ease taxation like Portugal is doing a lot Dubai is doing a lot and that's uh, respect so maybe we'll see many more jurisdictions accepting cryptocurrencies on the government level um, and, you know, allowing actually innovation to happen because when, when these things, what is most important is that we can innovate uh, and we can create more products and improve the, the old products. And so that you need tokens to be in circulation and uh, developers to see rewards in these tokens through, because as you may be aware that uh, developers are rewarded through either mining or uh, proof of stake mechanisms, uh, validating or nominating. So rewards happen in tokens and the more people use it, the higher the value of the token and the, the faster the system grows. And um, actually the, the positive side of Polkadot is that it has, uh, according to some studies, the largest amount of developers. So <laughs> We, we, we are um, quite an active community, which I'm very positive about, you know, uh, deployment of network and the amount of projects that will be built. And again, going back to our compatibility with Ethereum and ABM, uh, this will give opportunity to all the Ethereum ecosystem to benefit from scalability and this interoperability, hopefully. Yeah, we had a question from Tree who asked, is there any guide for developers to build their first dev on Polkadot or with Polkadot? Um, there is actually a, a GitHub for Polkadot or there is a Polkadot Wiki. So if you go to Polkadot Wiki, there will be uh, several sections. You want to build, you want to learn. So if you want to build, just press on build uh, and it will direct you to the uh, repository and to uh, all the information for developers. Also, I will encourage you to join Polkadot Discord channel and get in touch with developers because we are, um, as ambassadors and as a community, uh, we always encourage especially developers to become ambassadors because that actually gives you the opportunity to get in contact with the teams who are building. Uh, we have a lot of support from Piracy Technologies and Web3 Foundation for projects who want to build or already building uh, on Substrate. Uh, there are learning resources available. There's Web3 Substrate Academy and, you know, or just reach out to me if you have any specific question. I'm, I'm always happy to direct you to the right person. Great. You already spoke about incentives because I, I want to leverage your, you know, expertise 
in your training in architecture to look at the entire ecosystem of a blockchain community um, in terms of different elements and roles of different participants in the ecosystem. You know, what are the main participant groups or stakeholder groups in a blockchain ecosystem? How are they incentivized to do the work that they're doing so that on overall the community is thriving and secure and safe and growing and whatever else is their target? Well, of course, uh, the best thing to do is to, to become a developer, right? <laughs> because if you know how to code, if you know cryptography, you are... Uh... You can do anything and, and you can earn rewards and um, particularly now there is a high, high demand for Rust developers. Uh, but you can get involved as um, in marketing. So if, if you're thinking about kind of how the economy, so the, there are two categories. There are actually projects, um, so like development communities. So people with uh, uh, IT knowledge, development knowledge, uh, languages, uh, skills who are building infrastructure and building up. Then there are enterprises and companies like trade finance, like uh, logistics companies, real estate, gaming, art industry. So they all discovered the, the opportunities in the space. And uh, now everybody wants their own token. Every company wants their own token. Like a financial service um, um, ecosystem has been benefiting from this for quite a while because banks uh, and, and all the payment systems they began developing hyperledgers like years ago for their internal operations to secure it even more and to uh, have uh, the opportunity to have faster transactions but now we have d5 so it's like a topic on its own uh, and then we have people who are let's say called enthusiasts, blockchain enthusiasts, so people who are generally passionate about the internet of value, um, who want to learn, who want to get involved. And actually many end up, like myself included, um, being working for a project full time and, and diving into the blockchain space full time because it's really like a, a rabbit hole story. Like once you step in, once you get to know the people who are working in this amazing ecosystem, you know, that the uh, you get so inspired because everyone is just led by the big idea of changing the world. Uh, and actually, a lot of developers, they have a background in aerospace engineering, uh, which is fascinating. So, you know, that's why all these conversations about we're going to the moon, or we're going to the Pluto, it's all this galactic stuff, uh, which is very, very inspiring. And because the industry is growing so fast and so much, uh, there are more opportunities for marketers, for project managers, for content creators, for educators, because we still have the lack of education in the space. And, uh, you know, if you come from an industry like real estate, you'd probably, you know, if you start investing in tokens or start, you know, following projects or become an ambassador, I can assure you that majority of your colleagues and friends and family will be like, what is that you're doing? Um, can you tell me more? How can I how can I participate? And what is it, what is an NFT? You know, these things like once you spend a couple of months into this space, become sort of familiar, and you start feeling like, oh, everybody knows about it. Everybody's using tokens. But once you kind of go to the to more to your to your friends and family and uh, like your usual world, you discover that people don't know that much, and you actually contribute a lot by educating them of what you've learned and by sharing resources. And well, now, because we're in the bull run or in the new paradigm, uh, not clear yet, but there is a lot of media attention. So not just Bitcoin, but to other things, uh, infrastructural things, uh, fundamental things, art sector, uh, which, is, which gives me a lot of hope. <laughs> yeah, what would you have loved to know when you entered the space, like in 2016, 17, you said? Well, back then, in the early days, it was really difficult to understand who's the legitimacy, I think, is, is the big, uh, the big, big question and issue here. Uh, and still to date, uh, please, if you want to follow particularly Polkadot ecosystem projects, go to uh, polkadot.network, uh, find the directory of legitimate projects, um, check Web3 Foundation grant recipients, and if they actually delivered to what they promised after they received the grant. 
Uh, this would probably be the best way to know if team is legitimate because oftentimes projects, uh, they maybe come to the point of raising funds, but then they don't deliver uh, or they get a grant, but they don't deliver. So all these things count. Uh, so yeah, be, be very, very uh, mindful about uh, the projects. And the best way, of course, is to get to know the people, to get to know developers, because everybody's quite open and a lot of, well, here's another issue. A lot of the people are on social media and linking in on Twitter and traditional social media, but there are also a lot of imposters and a lot of accounts are being being copied and multiplied. <laughs> you, you need to make sure there is the right person. So like always make sure that uh, they post the content, the right content, they appear in the interview, that their face and voice is, is the one that you saw on on, you, on official YouTube channel. So like for any information of Polkadot on YouTube, refer to the YouTube channel uh, to know who is really working on projects. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's like thing number one for me with the Timothy and the people who are actually building uh, good quality um, infrastructure and uh, something that's uh, that's useful for all of us uh, rather than someone who's just uh, trying to take fast profits. And what would be your advice to entrepreneurs in this space? Somebody wants to build their own project or work on a project after they screened and made sure the people are right, what's the next step? How do you actually get engaged in a community? Um, well, you see, like my my thing with joining the ambassador program, I think that's probably the best way because you get in contact immediately with the development team and with the business team. Uh, it is good to use resources. Even platforms like Coursera actually have a lot of uh, useful business courses on applications and blockchain opportunities for business. Um, join meetups. Um, there will be next Ethereum meetup in Paris soon online, offline. Uh, there's a lot of meetups going on offline. Polkadot decoded just ended. It was on May 20th. There are recordings on, on YouTube available today. Get engaged with people. Uh, talk to professionals. Talk to, you know, because it depends, of course, what, uh, what you're trying to solve and what you're trying to improve in your industry as an entrepreneur. Because uh, everything, of course, starts from identifying, you know, hey, we, we're lacking this bit here. Uh, and there's actually a lot like it, it's been my own discovery of what blockchain technology can actually do because the first thing that comes to mind oh, is just Bitcoin or it's just Ethereum and it's just you kind of look at it as an asset but then think about blockchain as an infrastructure. Think of it as a system. Um, you can apply it for shipbuilding industry, for anything that's on supply chain. Um, I would strongly, strongly recommend you to read um, two new books by Don Stapskut and Alex Stapskut, which is uh, Financial Services Revolution and Supply Chain Revolution. Uh, this is very, very helpful. I recommend them to, to the companies I advise. Um, as uh, they, you know, they provide use cases, they have links with uh, financial services, with uh, uh, different industries. Uh, there's a lot of, well, there will be a lot of happening in the infrastructure sector for improving. I don't know, just think about anything that eliminates the middleman, uh, where you need to eliminate middlemen and improve your operations, uh, improve the speed of transactions, improve security. Security is probably uh, like the, the most important thing here where you want uh, anything that, that has to do with certification, for instance, uh, is it, a good uh, use case for blockchain technology. Gaming, gaming is going to be massive because what NFTs did for gaming, you literally now, like before you would open a game, you would start playing, you buy different assets in the game. And then when you leave the game, it's all gone. Uh, you cannot just take them to another game. No, you cannot do anything. That that's that was why uh, Vitalik basically tweeted why he wanted to you know preserve the assets of the game. So with NFTs, you you play your game, you finish playing the game, you can take your assets, put them in your wallet, and keep them there, and then insert them like start playing with them in another game, or you can put it into a liquidity pool. You can use it as collateral. So it becomes a, a completely financial instrument. 
Uh, and what another thing actually that I like a lot about blockchain space in general is that it kind of forces us to learn more about finance. Because um, I, my personal feeling is that when you know when you start learning about banking system because it's been there for years, uh, it's so complex, it's so complicated. There's not enough information. You literally need to go and study finance. You know, do a master degree in finance to be able to understand how things work to to invest your money. Or you need to go to a bank, uh, find a financial advisor, uh, and do your investments. Um, and with the blockchain, um, you know, because there is so much available, even like Web3 Foundation has a course on the blockchain, you just, you just reassess your relations with money, with assets, with value, um, and you start learning about investors, investments, collateral, um, liquidity pools. So like we're using all this um, jargon that is uh, specific to the financial industry, but is now kind of becoming part of our life. Just what happened with uh, when when we got access to internet and social media platforms, like just becoming our own creator of media content and becoming a blogger. That's kind of what is what I see is happening with our finances. Now we're learning more about it. You know, before people learn how to edit videos, how to use different uh, like mediums and Adobe Photoshop and Premiere Pro to put your video together to do your editing. And now like even the level of creators advanced so much that you know it's no longer just uh, uh, just the phone so the same thing is happening with finance as if before you would just buy a, a bitcoin now there are so many instruments that are evolving and you can actually build a portfolio uh, and the investment becomes something that you own and you control uh, and you take your own decisions so you don't need to uh, consult your bank, even though you probably need to consult the financial advisor still, if you're if you're scared of volatility and you need to do a due diligence on on the projects and tokens. Well, thank you very much. This was very passionate, authentic sharing of, of your your um, yeah passion with with the industry. If there was one last thing you want to share with our community, now is the time to do so before we wrap up. Um, I would say do your own research. Um, just educate yourself because once the more you read, the more you get to understand. Uh, I believe the more you will be involved in this new economy. And this is the opportunity for all of us to take control of our life back, uh, to take control of our identities, of our information, of our money, of everything that has been in the hands of big corporations, big social media platforms, now is the chance for you to have your own responsibility, which is often not easy, uh, can be painful because you lose seed phrases and, <laughs> and things like that, and hopefully this will improve. But educate yourself. Educate yourself, do a lot of research, connect with industry professionals. Uh, it is very, very important. The community is very open. Um, when I entered myself, I met, you know, with a lot of CEOs of companies who would just dedicate their time to talk to you, to explain you things, to get to know you. That's, that's very powerful, you know, because if in the traditional, try to go to a bank and talk to the CEO of the bank, you probably won't be able to. But in the, in the blockchain community, founders of projects are very open to uh, to people who use their services, and there is such thing as AMA, ask me anything. Uh, so join those gatherings, join those um, uh, those community events, raise your voice, ask your questions, give your opinions. Um, no question is a bad question, and if you need to learn, really take your responsibility and take your power back, uh, and help us all build a new economy. This would be my my message to you. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, sharing your insights and your passion with us. We now have seven minutes for breakout rooms. So I will put everybody into automated breakout rooms. And Irina, do you want to join us for another few minutes or do you have to jump off? Yeah, I can join you. I have a few more minutes. Yeah. No problem. Okay, amazing. So I'm opening the rooms and then you guys are all in there and then we come back for a closing together. Thanks. Thank you.